All right. So as everybody joins, uh, welcome in. Um, welcome to Scaling Multifamily bra Brands Live. Uh, I want to go ahead and get started right now. So the topic for today is how to sell in multifamily without leading or landing any meetings or demos. So I know that's like, well, how in the heck do you do that, right? I mean, that's that seems kind of crazy, but I, I will talk to you and want to stimulate some conversation around this. And then we're going to go to some Q&A where you can ask questions. We've got pages of questions um, already, but if you show up live, this is a great opportunity to bring those forward. And again, this is not sort of a competitive environment. This is really truly designed to be helpful. There's a modern way to do things. A lot of the content right now that's created is uh, around and built around an old way of, of how the marketplace is behaving and what consumers expect. And so we've sort of, um, you know, we're trying to bring things to um, a, a process where customers, you make it easy for them to learn about your product, easy for them to get in touch with you, and easy for you to get your product in the hands of the customers. Now, for this show this event this live event we're focused on multifamily investors um, multifamily operators so the investors are looking to raise capital the investors are looking to um, you know just establish trust uh, multifamily operators are looking to expand their third-party management business um, find talent uh, and when you have a trusted brand when you have a brand that people recognize and they understand how you think, then people start to show up and want to be part of those things. And so uh, it's definitely, um, you know, focus around that. And then you have all the industry partners where the innovation is happening, the exciting things that are coming to the marketplace that are changing the way that we're running our business. Those are our, our vendors, our operators, our suppliers, those people that need to sell into that space. And so we want to be helpful and, and, and um, supportive of those things so those products don't run flat and operators don't miss out on great opportunities. So before we dive into this topic, um, I just again want to welcome all the people in Zoom. Go ahead and just keep letting people in um, on the admit all, Jim. Just let them roll in. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll, um, we'll uh, I guess, welcome them as they come in. So it, it's, it's um, you know, so great to see, I guess, um, people that have come back from last week. This is, we're, we're going to do this every Thursday. And if you miss it, we have the podcast. We will make it very easy for you to, if you've got another meeting, you're out there selling, you're having a great conversation, that's the goal, right? Don't stop building business to come here because you can actually listen to this uh, on the podcast. And we'll make sure you get that um, after it's produced. So, Make sure if you are here, turn on your cameras. I want to see you. This is a, this is not a broadcast. This is designed to be a productive meeting. Um, we do plenty of things that we do large 12,000 person investment summits and innovation summits and things like that. So this is a great opportunity to, to see you and, and uh, interact in, in a meeting format. So at the bottom of Zoom, you know how to use Zoom. There's a way you can click there. It's a reactions button and you can raise your hand if you have a question and you can ask that live. Um, I don't know that I have all the answers, but at least we'll understand and get some intel about things that you care about, things that may be obstacles, uh, things that we can support in knocking down so uh, business growth can happen. So um, I don't know if it's in the top left corner of your Zoom, but Jim Miller here on our team is uh, available. He's going to bring the questions forward. And if you want to, in the chat, you've got an idea, something that we're saying brings up a question or an idea, shoot it shoot a message to Jim Miller. He's uh, here with us. Jim, go ahead and just wave, wave at everybody. Hey, everybody. There he is. There he is. Um, yeah, Jim, uh, you, those of you that met Jim last week, uh, strong background. Uh, there's a reason why he's here is because he's lived through a lot of the world that you're living through um, as we are. And so want to bring as much resource um, that we can do. So, uh, let's do this. Let's let's roll. I have a few thoughts that we're going to share uh, at the opening, and then we'll go to Q and A, uh, and we'll see what we can what we, what fun we can make together here. So, what I'm trying to get accomplished here is um, how do we sell without landing any meetings or demos? That's the big idea. So, everything that we're doing here is about efficiency, faster speed to market and not relying on having more control over the process. So the first thing 
I'd like for you to start thinking about. Now, again, these are my perspectives. We've got a lot of results with these things, and um, we want to make those things available to you. So I want you to start thinking about instead of selling or getting meetings or getting clients to, you know, chasing them down, calling them, all of those things, is focus on developing trust and expertise. And when you think about it, even the brands that you have, if it's your phone or your cars or whatever that is, it's you have some level of trust and you understand like those people are good at that thing. Even if it's a restaurant, you know, Trevor's on here. I know tacos are important. I had some tacos yesterday and there's a place that I think of first when I go there because I have, I know I, I'm, I've experienced it. I understand it. Um, there's some level of, I know that they're, this is kind of a crazy example, but they're experts in that, right? So um, the question I have for you is, is it best to accomplish trust and expertise in a meeting? Right? You got your ideal client, the, the, the investor that you want to meet with, and if they're, they're buying and they just raised a fund and they've got the portfolio and you want to manage it. And is it best in a meeting to, to, to transfer that trust, establish that trust, right? And, and I don't know that it is. I know that we sometimes have to do that. We have to do it fast. You've been in those meetings. You know how it is. It's like, why are you? Why should we hire you? And does your product even work? And well, what about these guys? And you know all that stuff. So, one of the things that I see a lot of people doing is they're out there trying to get meetings. And that's honestly, people are like you, out of time, right? Distracted by so many things. I've always said your competition is not who you think it is. Your competition is the attention span of your ideal client. Right? How do you cut through the noise? And yes, uh, or last week's talk, we talked about how actually to do that, to think differently. But think about the meeting. Is that best place to actually have that opportunity? Or should we be sharing our expertise? Right? What? What, what are you, who are some people that you, you, you live in the world outside of multifamily, you're just living life. Who are the people that you trust? You know, even if you want to put in the chat, right? Like who are the people that you trust? Who do you think of as an expert? If I were talking about leadership, maybe you'd say it's John Maxwell, right? You've read a book or seen a talk or people pass along, you know, whatever it is. Uh, maybe for marketing, it's, you know, Seth Godin. He's a, a you know, thought leader, gets people to think differently, just done some, you know, keynotes, uh, newsletters, whatever it is. Maybe it's TV and you're watching Dr. Phil. And he's, what is he, a psychologist? Uh, he gives advice on people that can't work through problems. Right? So I'm not on Dr. Phil's email list, but I know that he's pretty good. I know that Oprah hired him and that made him famous because he got out of a lawsuit because he understood how people make decisions and behave and what influences those things. And then he got a talk show and all the rest is sort of history, but he's training the world every day that he knows. Number one, I think, right? Like, I don't want to get into Dr. Phil. I don't, I don't know his capabilities and licensings and stuff like that, but there are, there are expertise that are on display without having a meeting. You're just watching it, right? And he's training the world that he knows what he's talking about. And so what is interesting to me is what I see a lot of other brands in multifamily, some of the best brands even, uh, doing in the marketplace is they understand that content is important. And they're like, listen, we got to get out there. We got to educate. For us, we've created an education-based marketing system, right? The whole idea is to get clients to call you instead of trying to figure out how to call them. But content alone is not enough. You can't just inform people. You have to give them something um, more than just information. Um, you know, I, I mentioned the Ford commercial. You know, it's, I don't know, 7,000 pounds. It's, uh, it's a four by four. It's, um, it's black. You know, it's uh, four wheel drive. Information, information, information. Facts, facts, facts. Facts don't sell. Emotions sell. And an emotionally unaffected buyer will, don't, will not convert and they're not going to pay attention to your content. So, we have to give somebody, well, we have to give, well, everybody that we think is the people we want to sell to something that they don't get anywhere else. Now, on a TV commercial with Ford, they don't talk about, there, there are facts and details like financing terms and interest rates. Details are important to the logical buyer, 
but the emotional buyer, maybe not so much. So they're, it's the visual of the, the truck out on the road or they show the car pulling up uh, with somebody dressed in, you know, um, with a tuxedo under the lights of a v, uh, valet showing a black car. That's how they show black. They don't say it's black. They show black reflecting the lights glimmering off of the valet when the person pulls out. And, you know what I mean? So the, these are the things. So it's, it's not enough just to inform people. That's what I'm getting to. What, what, these are human beings that we're talking to. You're not selling to companies. I know business to business is business to company, but you're selling to people that work within companies. And these people have feelings, they have thoughts, they have fears, they have things they want to do in life, all of that stuff. So we have to give people something that they're not getting anywhere else, something about thinking different. So if you want to, I, I test things all the time. So go check out my LinkedIn profile. I did a post uh, this week. I, I don't remember when I did it. Um, and it's about the looming rent affordability crisis. So I'm, I'm posting things that my customers care about. Right, So we want our clients to do well. So on LinkedIn, I made a post, and it's pretty much something that you wouldn't get anywhere else. You're certainly not going to get that information from an apartment association because, number one, their supporters would say, whoa, hey, wait, whoa, whoa, you can't say that, or they would back up, right? Because we're, we've, got a, we've got a real big problem in our industry around rent affordability, and we've got to open up our ideas to newer and bigger ideas and at some point, we've got we've to think about a new way to do something, right? So it, information that you're publishing or content that you're publishing, if you're not trying to get a meeting and you're trying to build trust online, has to be different. So people, again, they don't want our products or information. They want to know what's possible or they want a problem solved. Nobody gets excited about reading white papers or downloading reports or anything like that. Nobody woke up today and thinking, I need a white paper. They're in a meeting, and they're saying, I'm not really there. I need some justification, as Jim told me this morning. I need some justification, because maybe I'm a logical buyer, and I've got to tell someone else about something, and I need some facts to support this big idea. But nobody wakes up thinking, today, I'm running an apartment. I'm building a portfolio, building a company. I need to learn something today. So they all wake up with a problem to be solved or a bigger and better future to be created. And so you're going to create content that's going to showcase your expertise solving their problem or creating their bigger and better future in advance without the meeting. Right? We're talking about developing trust and expertise. And when you do that, guess what? When you are the expert, when you understand what you, what you have to offer that solves the problem of the client, and it doesn't, in a way, in context to the problem they want to solve, like on my LinkedIn post, sales is easy. So back to my point, content is not enough. Okay, You have to create content in context to the problems that your, con your clients want to solve. So, for example, you know, if you're pushing in smart uh, technology about IoT or, you know, technology that needs to plug into other things, technology that people have not bought before. You know, so you're creating content to help people become a great customer, like how to think about buying the product, how to think about doing due diligence on smart home technology. But they really don't want all those things. They just want to be able to lease, right, when someone doesn't show up to work or after hours, or they want to meet the customer in a modern way, the way the customers are demanding, and there's enough data around that to show want to experience things. So you're helping your customer make a great decision about the product or the problems they want to solve or the opportunities they want to create in advance without the meeting, right? So the, we do know that people are searching for these things. They are talking about these things in meetings and small groups. And when they're talking about those things, are they discovering you? Is your expertise that you have out there to help people knock down the obstacles in their business? Do they think of you like they think of um, other experts, right? So let me give you kind of an example of that. We, we help multifamily investors uh, and operators create a competitive advantage, right? That's the, if they have trust and they have authority and they have their expertise out there, that's their competitive advantage because remember, 
their competition is not who they think it is. Their competition is the attention span of their ideal client. So if they're trusted more and they're understood more and they understand how they think about their portfolios and how they think about hiring and that they've uh, become one of the best companies to work for, then that gives them that competitive advantage. That's what we're moving towards. And we do that, not just to do that, we do that so they can raise capital faster, that they can attract better talent. And guess what? Everybody, even on this call, wants to grow their business. And how do we do that? We extract their knowledge and we share that knowledge on a platform called podcasting. We run events. They speak at events. Uh, we do articles. We do all these things because, listen, the more complex your offer is, the more difficult it is to understand, the more time it takes to transfer the knowledge. And just like Netflix is, I mean, you can watch a series of 13, uh, a series of, I don't know, Breaking Bad back in the day. And if, you, if that were one movie, it would be, I don't know how many hours, you would never do it. You would never sit there for that long and watch that whole, that movie wouldn't, or that series wouldn't have happened because it's just, bro it's broken up, you know? And you got to break up your content. You don't need a 20 page white paper. You need, you know, three paragraphs out there, like on my LinkedIn. What? It's not even, I didn't even ask anybody to do anything. I didn't ask them to buy anything. They'll fit, and by the way, the kind of people that reached out to me is phenomenal. There's likes on there and comments, which is great, and thousands and thousands of views, which is great, but that's not what I was going for. What I have now is people wanting to meet with me, wanting to have me look at deals. I had some of the most amazing people reach out to me that I thought like, oh man, I got I to gotta level up here. Right. So again, it's posting something in context to a problem they want to solve. Right. And then naturally, you will end up having even more meetings. The, the clients call you. That's the goal. The, the clients call you. And when they call you, you're not convincing them. You're qualifying them. So tell me what you're working on and how's that going? How are you going about doing this? Right. So it's that expertise and trust. Right. That 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 accelerator when you do these things that gets the phone ringing now for us let me let me give you a little bit more understanding of like the how in the messaging and the things that we say out in the world when we structure things we do it differently I, I know like not every we're not designed to help everybody right but we're designed for gladiators people that understand that they're modern marketers that uh it's just the way that we're living. And we structure things differently when we produce content. This, what it does is it allows us to position and sell at scale without these meetings. What I mean by that is, for example, one word that we use differently than most, and that's the word most. We use, we use the language of most, just write that word down and, and think about how to work that into your conversations the next calls. Here's how it works. Most is a very important word because the reader's sitting there like, oh, wait a minute. Good. That's not me. I'm, that, that's most people. I'm not like most people. So if I'm in a meeting and I'm saying, you know what? Um, this thing that you're doing is challenging and you, you know you can help the client. The client's doing it an old way. So for example, I'll give you a way that we would use the word most. So the flaw in the way most people go about marketing their business is that they provide lots of information talking about their product, all about them, all about what they have, right? It's not in it for the customer, right? It's not the customer's problem. They don't want your thing. They want their problem solved. So when I say most people, what ends up happening for these individuals consuming the content is that, um, well, for us, what we do is we create trust and we demonstrate expertise um, so our clients become the trusted advisor. That accelerates sales and, you know, all that stuff around hiring more people and fussing with trade shows, right? But what, what ends up happening is these customers, as they consume that content, what they're thinking is, hmm, I've been going about it this way, 
And now there's this other way, and it's different. And what what's happening is they're thinking like maybe they're maybe what I'm, maybe it's not me. I'm not broke. I'm not broken. I'm I'm a good marketer. I'm a good at sales. Maybe I'm just going about it wrong. And there's this sort of lean in where the bottom line is, you know, they're just feeling better about your content because they don't feel like, hey, well, I'm having a problem getting clients today. It's not it's not really that I'm just not good at sales. It's like, well, maybe I'm doing it a different way. Most people go about that way. And, you know, I've been doing that thing. And there's this new thing over here. Okay. At the end of the day, all you're trying to do is, you know, help your potential client live in this better world, hopefully with your product or business, right? And, and their life gets better. Their business gets better. They enjoy you as a client and, you know, problems get solved. You really don't need a meeting to show them that, though. In fact, it's not even ideal to be in a meeting to do that. You want to show them a better way for them to consume this content, just like binge. you're seeing it on Netflix, you're seeing binge-worthy content. Uh, my LinkedIn post is just one. You're going to build on another one, build on another one. And then there's, a, there's, there's a, a journey that people need to go on. And if you do this, you just might have more meetings. Now, when you take that viewpoint and you use video, to share with the world, and it doesn't have to be always video. People like to listen on a podcast. They like to read, written word. They like to watch, right? That's why we have TV, radio. Some people like to watch movies. Some people like to watch highlights, right? So make the movie. Then you can always make the highlights and transform it into written word and do all those things. So we use video because we can do it once and it does many things but you're, you're going to see a whole new world of possibilities. So again, listen, everybody wakes up every day with the current situation and a desire for a bigger and better future. It may be the person you're trying to get a meeting from just wants a promotion. So maybe your product that you're talking about could be a risk for them. So when, you, when you're thinking about these things, you've got to be considering how, how other people you're trying to sell to live in the world. They have some problem they want solved, and they want some other thing that they want to do. It could be they want to be the president of a management company someday. Well, maybe when you're having meetings, you're framing things like, listen, last person <laughs> last person that we went with, I know this is a new thing for you because this is a new thing for the whole industry, but last time we did this, we did it so well, we increased the revenue to X. That person got promoted. They're now the VP of that company. So there's the emotional language in a conversation that, and I'm not, I mean, those things have to all be true and have had happened, right? But that's what, that's what's going on in these people that you're talking to. They have lives and worlds and they've got, you know, dinners to go to and recitals, children's events, and, you know, they're dealing with working from home, all, all these types of things. And so when we get into the hearts and minds of these people, and then we extract our knowledge and expertise out on a platform that allows them to learn at home, last week I talked about, you've heard people say, um, I want to sleep on it, or let me think about it. Well, they're thinking at home. Now they're working at home even more. This is where all the thinking happens. So give them all the available tools in the forms of which they want to consume it available to them, right? So again, all of our stuff, anytime we produce content, it has to pass a stress test or a filter. Like, does this make a problem go away for somebody? And does this help them make a bigger and better future? Even this call today, this Zoom, I mean, if, if, if what I say doesn't help you understand one thing, not, you don't have to agree with anything I'm saying, really, right? Or, or, but there's, there could be one little thing that just goes, you know what, I mean, that could be interesting, you know? And you're just trying to help people, you know, interact with the content and, you know, cut through the noise, Right? Most people are avoided, again, to, they're, they're trying to avoid pain and to gain pleasure. So when you run into that content and it agitates that pain, right, it, it, it's, it's getting to remind them, like, yeah, I got to deal with this thing, okay? I'm sitting here and you know, the problem is different. I got I to gotta figure out how to solve it. Uh, this, this person's helping me along the way. You know, it gives them hope that there's a solution or 
an opportunity here instead of selling. Like even the fact on your calls to action, if it says demo request or can I get a meeting with you, but what's that's the goal of the meeting? Can I share some time with? I want to. I want to um, ask. You know, I'm working on. I did a thing where I did a survey, got almost hardly any responses, which was bizarre. It was sent out to a lot of people, and then I did another survey. I said, Hey, can you can I ask for your help? People are lovely people. And because I've done this and this and this, they wanted to help, and they're like, yes. And they took the survey, and but beyond that, they're like, responding like to me, hey, I took the survey, awesome. Like, it was just a, all kinds of stuff because I changed one word. Nobody wants to take a survey. But I said, can I get your help? I'm, I've got to do a talk on this thing. Can you, can you answer some of these questions? It would help me. Right. Go back and look at that LinkedIn post I'm talking about. You're going to see, and you'll actually see somebody even ask, like, hey, what do you do and what kind of things do you offer? It's, yes, last week we talked about catching the feather. Right? Constantly testing what, what works. This is not theory. These are things that actually work. You, they can work for you too. Um, I'm going to just uh, sort of wrap up here and you know, pretty much you know, the way that I do things is I want to just come in with some, some fire and <laughs> get you to think and go, hey, I got a question about that. But all this is to give you new strategies, not outdated strategies, right? Um, can, can I, do you guys all have, what time is it? It's 12, 20, or it's one twenty six here in Arizona. So we've been going a little bit here, longer than usual. But if I can give you a homework assignment that's going to allow you to think about the resistance you're going to run into with all these things, right? Because when I do these things, like it's not like people are like, oh yeah, let's. It's not exciting at first because the result is long term, but when you get the long term, it's like you just it, it makes all, everything that you do next even easier. But there's a movie that I just watched on HBO. I number one, it's a great movie. It's called King Richard. I don't know. Raise your hand if you guys have ever seen it. Um, it's, uh, it's on HBO. I don't know if it's in the movie theaters or where it is, but I went into this movie not knowing what it is and actually experienced it the way the director intended you to experience it, like as the movie happened. I didn't see the trailer. Nobody said, it's a good movie. You got to see it. It's funny. I wasn't predisposed of anything. I just watched the movie. And it's basically about Serena Williams and Vin, uh, Venus Williams. They're tennis players, famous tennis players. They've been amazing things in, in their uh, professional uh, athlete career. Their dad is played by Will Smith. Um, it's a great movie. And basically, it shows this character of her dad having this sort of idea about how their career would go. And the whole idea for him was, let's get him out of Compton. And during their journey, basically, he goes on hiring coaches. And he, I think the dad takes him to a point, And then he's like, got to bring in better experts. But he consults with the top experts uh, in the world around tennis and, you know, players that have, um, gone down a predictable path. They went to these junior tennis tournaments, all these things. And basically they had this path that all these other well-known, highly successful, um, tennis players have taken. And so every coach he went and talked to wanted them to go down this road where they got the sponsor and then they burn them out and, and all this kind of stuff. But the dad even when millions of dollars were on the table, and th this family was struggling financially, millions of dollars on the table were at stake. He kind of held true to his goals, which was, you know, he wanted, he had a big vision around uh, their career, but all these experts didn't have that vision. They had a vision of the same process, the same path. Go to the junior league tournaments, drive, 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 get seen, do these tournaments, win and advance this way. And, this was people from the best in the game. This guy got resistance from people that were very smart, just like Elon Musk got resistance from very smart people in the automotive business. This will never work. Direct his customer, like fighting him. So as you create this stuff, you will get resistance. Your bosses will say, I don't, I don't know. I've never done that before. Well, they didn't grow up in this world, Right. So you'll need to watch this movie. It's very inspiring. What happens is you start believing in your own capabilities and your own understanding of if I can become 
if I can help other people know about what I'm capable of, the expertise that I have, the problem that I can solve for people, the product that helps people, in the end, the result will never, like, you can't, it's uncontested. You know, it's, 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 it, it, it's uncontested. So right now, our predictable path, just like this dad, when he went to these experts, they're saying, go to the junior league tennis tournaments and do all these things. He wanted them to learn languages and go to school and to have, took him to Disney World one day, like live a life. And our predictable path for our experts is, you know, go to trade shows, get some leads, chase down those leads, try to get them on a sales call and hope that we can transfer that trust in that meeting. So I just, all I'm asking you today to do today is test your assumptions and think differently because that's, those people that think differently are going to be the ones that create the top sales in, the, in their organizations, the people that create the top brands that scale, the people that are known for whatever it is. And if you can do that, you can sell without even being in a meeting or a demo or whatever, it, you know, tutorial, trial, whatever it is that you need. So... I know we've got a lot of questions. If you've got questions in the chat, let me know. I'd like to move to Q&A and give everybody the opportunity to say hello, if nothing else, and um, you know, settle with a little bit of what I said. If you have any thoughts or um, ideas around that, I'd love to hear from you guys. Patrick, I did have one that uh, I'd like to pull up, if that's OK. Sure. Um, there's a question about, um, you know, biggest sales challenges is building new relationships. So um, maybe talk about how to do that effectively without doing meetings and demos. All right. So it's a great one. And, you know, I think all of you have, I hope, LinkedIn accounts. And you start to notice every connection request looks the same. You know, they were they read an article, a blog post, or they were trained about something, and they're like, you know, say this thing and build the relationship, you know, all that stuff. And you can kind of sense the sincerity of it. I think you'd all agree. And I think the problem is it's, I think, where they try and form those relationships. It's probably not in the email. It's probably not in the inbox of LinkedIn. It may be like the post that I created where it's uh, you, you start attracting people that are like, boy, I think like, I think like him. I like the way he thinks. I like, I like that. And so then, then that introduction conversation is very different. Or if I'm in sales, you know, and I see um, good things happen for the companies I want to move products into, I may do thing I may start following their success and acknowledge them without the call to action, without the meeting request, without the hey, this is what we do and 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 just it's just a sign off. You know, like hey, like for example, yesterday we recognized 50 national uh, companies for being creating a healthy organization, right? So even if you're not in that program or even a client of ours, that's free public information that people can just reach out and say, hey, you know, awesome job building this company. Like, you know, we reward people for buying a lot of things, but this is really unique. Awesome job. You know, it's just, it's celebratory, right? Um, and then I think also, for example, I mentioned to my wife, Carrie, I'm like, I'm, I'm going to have Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos, I'm going to interview them someday. And the reason why I'm going to interview them is I'm going to create content. Then they're, if they're, I know real estate is a massive industry for both of those leaders, right? One of them I'm inspired by. I don't know that I subscribe to every. I don't know them enough. I've never met them to to make recommendations on business practices and things like that. But I know that when one of the wealthiest people in the world wants to make life easier for people and knows that people will always want lower costs of things, that when I do posts and content, when they're trying to enter a real estate industry, they're going to want to enter with people that think like them or at least understand 
the same values of how they see the world, right? Whereas most of the real estate operators right now, if you think the way they do business, the whole idea is to get the, res the customer to pay more. And Elon Musk over there is talking about, you know, um, uh, a cleaner environment and, you know, a sustainable world. And literally an automaker that has said, the government's saying, we're going to give you money for R&D to make batteries. And he's like, more subsidies are problematic to the bigger picture of everybody that lives in the world. So there's a little bit more of care and concern over bigger ideas in the world. So what I'm doing is if I want relationships with those people, let's say, then I've got to step up to a world that they would want to work in and, and, and feel like there's a, re a match, right? And so when you're building these relationships, I think it's first we've been taught to build them in networking meetings or in phone calls, cold calls, or let's get coffee all those things that require the energy of like, I've got to make a decision to do something with you. But if you take all that off the table and you give them your awesomeness out in the world that makes them easy to see, we see celebrities. That's why when Kobe passed, it was a very sad thing. We all felt like we knew him. I never knew him. Did you guys meet him? But it was a tremendous loss. We knew how he bought a helicopter so he could be there with his kids to commute. Like, there was amazing things that we knew about this human being. And, and, and that's just what was published. So I think for building relationships, we're all in that media. You're a media company first. And you'll attract what you talk about. So, you know, that's what you got to get clear about. Like, who first in this relationship building process do you want to spend time with? And then figure out what would someone like that want in a person to spend time with and then either become that or talk about those things. And then it, it sort of comes on the inbound. I know it's a long-term strategy, but it does work. Um, and anyway, that's, that's a long riff on, on that response. Jim, anything else you got? Yeah, Patrick, uh, Gabe Bunting had a question that I thought was really cool. So he's, he's, uh, said, yeah, awesome. come on. And so we've got him unmuted and I'd like to have him ask you his question. All right. Welcome in Dave. Hey, Patrick. Thanks for taking the time to answer my question. Um, so I built a very similar business in multifamily, uh, basically pounding away on trade shows for years and years and years. And, um, so as we started this business a couple of years ago, um, you know, COVID came into play and, and trade shows went away. And so I guess my question is, as the world has evolved, can we rely on or, or has social media been able to replace the physical interaction, the relationships you build face to face or, or is social media just a supplement and you really got to get out and pound the pavement? That's such a great question. Dave, what do you guys do? Just real quick. We, uh, we sell building supplies, furniture. Uh, it's mostly a light, light fixtures, plumbing fixtures, um, and furniture to student housing and multifamily. Awesome. Well, first, thank you for the question, and it's a great one. And here's the thing. What historically has happened, and it hasn't changed in decades, is we've had to rely on intermediaries to go to market. And let's just not pick on our own industry for a minute. Let's just pick on Hollywood. You know, at first it was Netflix disrupted Blockbuster. But it actually was disrupting Hollywood next, but nobody saw that coming. In other words, there wasn't enough really good um, actors on Netflix in early days. And then you saw, oh, wait, uh, this actor's on there. And then now everybody wants in. And so the move to away from trade shows and, um, you know, these types of activities is not going to come from your competition because that's maybe where they're winning and they've won there before. And I think it's not going to come from maybe an owner or a, someone that's gone before you because they haven't gone through any of this stuff, this shift, right? So that's what my point of being prepared, watching that movie, knowing like you're going to run into resistance. But when you do the math, it's the math is you know, phenomenal. And by the way, I'm not saying don't ever do trade shows or don't ever do in-person events, but start looking at what's special about those things and amplify that and minimize the things involved, right? Like maybe scale down your booth or 
start with, let's just spend 50% less on the trade show, right? But here's, here's my take on this. We've always had this intermediary. We thought, well, we have to join this trade association, and then we have to wait for them to plan a meeting, and then when they do it, we have to go to this space. And that's not the case anymore. You have a direct relationship with the customer right on social media. But one thing that we don't want to do online is ever replace the, the fist bump, the high five, the dinner meeting, all of those things. This is an opportunity for you, Dave, and anybody listening to really lean into what made those experiences great. Is that's At that time when we did trade shows, that's where everybody was. So now you become the event. There's nothing wrong with you creating your own, you know, dinner or event or experience. Just like, I mean, everybody at some point is on an email list to get notified of something going on. So that's our goal is to make you the media company where you have a direct relationship with the customer and you don't need to meet them in an in-person event. I produce events. I would be crazy to say this, right? Like, I produce events. And I told in 2019, I said trade shows were dead. We went to streaming. In 2020, they actually died. I wrote an article on that. It was kind of like I didn't expect it to happen from that. But now events are shifting in that the way that people build community and they feel connected because we're humans is been through work. I mean, most of the time we're at work. Well, now because these um, companies are not even out, their towers all working together, you know, now they're all over the place. Like the events are not like these big, big conferences anymore. They can just be, this is an event right here. You're experiencing an event. I invited you to this, but I didn't come here to sell you something. I'm creating time with you and trying to help the things you want to have introduced or go away. So you, you can do the same, same thing. But I, I, I don't think we should be thinking about it being like anything else. And when you look at motion pictures, we call them movies. But before they were movies, they were pictures that had motion and people didn't know how to talk about it. So they're like, it's a motion picture. <laughs> um, you know, cordless phone. Who, what the, this is a cordless phone. At some point, all phones had cords. It became a cordless phone. Then it became a cellular phone because it was cellular. Now it's what, just mobile? People don't know how to talk about what's coming and because they don't know it's, it's different from what's been. So I think don't try and make it like, like it's just start all over. Like you never ever needed it, like it never even happened. What would you do today to find the people that need the thing that you have? How could you reach them? And, you know, and by the way, when you're at those shows anyway, you're, you're fighting for their attention. Remember I talked about attention span being your issue? So you're fighting for their attention at those events. So um, I, I'm thinking about you becoming, everybody on this call becoming their own media company having their own relationship with their customer, and anybody in the middle eventually will be gone. We used to go to AAA to get roadmaps. We used to mm -hmm. join AAA, right? Now, guess what? All the cars actually just work. The cars that they make work. So the AAA was the towing company in the middle. You th at a point in time, you needed them, because cars broke down all the time and it was like a product. But now car makers are like making cars that don't break or at least they're warranting them. They found a way to make the customer happy. And so they were in the, the, the AAA Auto Association was in the middle. Now they're, it's, I don't know how many times you guys think about them anymore. People used to go on vacations and literally go to AAA to get maps. So, I think it's exciting that this is happening. I'm excited that you're even, the fact that you're here thinking about and asking that question is the first step. Um, and hopefully on these calls, we can help you 
you know, this is what we do for our clients. But those that like you are like, well, how do I figure this out? That's what this call is about is for us just to transfer that information so you can do it yourself. Or if you needed help, we would, we would help you with that too. But I think you'd be a media company. You'd become your own event. Perfect. Thank you. What, are your, what do you think about my thoughts on that? Was I, I mean, it's long, but does that feel possible? Does it like, do you feel like that was helpful? Sorry, am I unmuted now? Yeah, you're unmuted now. I know it's yeah, like okay. sometimes you click um, and you think you're on. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, it, it, it basically um, verifies what I was kind of thinking in my head already. Um, but in, in our business is doing good, but we really want to take that next step. And um, you know, these trade shows, uh, there's a lot of restrictions, COVID tests, vaccines. I mean, there's all these requirements and then they may or may not happen. If we make a $25,000, $30,000 commitment. I can't, we can't spend that kind of money. And so I'm like, listen, we can build this business, but we have to just throw away everything that we've ever done before and start fresh. And you just validated that. So. I've been to every trade show, but I've never attended a trade show. <laughs> so what'll happen is I'll spend, you mentioned 30,000, I'll spend $30,000 on a, on an ad. If I wanted to, I don't even have to, I don't even have to have an audience. I can buy the audience. I can put my message in front of people. $30,000 just to let you know, I, I got 2.9 million people to see it in multifamily for that kind of money. That's what I'm trying to, and it's not that, it's not that um, that's like modern news. That's just easy. And so what, what happens when someone goes to, everybody flies into the trade show. What are they looking at? Their ticket. Where are they looking at their ticket? Online. Oh, they got a notification. You know, Trevor liked the post. Okay, great. They're on Facebook. Bam. All of a sudden, I'm at the trade show for like 45 cents. Well, I think I think you you, you <laughs> tap onto some interesting stuff, Patrick, because I I I think the trade shows are a dying breed, um, mainly because like yeah, like thirty thousand dollars to attend an event is insane. Like we just did our twenty twenty one budget recap and saw that like on average we we're spending anywhere between sixteen and thirty grand to go to these conferences, and that's with travel expenses, that's with like lodging, all that fun stuff, and. Like I, I have some stuff that we're in the works for this next year where we're going to, I think seven different markets and we're renting a venue. We are bringing in catering. We're bringing in a keynote. We're bringing in a few partners on this and it's a mini trade show, but we're, it's, it's going to be feedback loops. Like we want to be able to talk about our product in a very candid way where people can tell us openly of like, here's what sucks. Here's what works. Here's what doesn't. Here's what like I need as a maintenance person on site to do this. Here's what I need as a regional to do this and like build that out so that like you can have more intimate moments and then expand it and like go out to different markets and have like five partners where it's like a, it's like a 30 to one ratio instead of a one to one ratio like aim was this year. Like it, it's that kind of stuff is just, it's not cost effective at all. Yeah. Uh, that is amazing strategy. I love that. And what Trevor's doing there is he's thinking about his clients, the feedback loop, like before it used to be, there was management companies and vendors. Well, they're all, we're all vendors, right? But, so the difference is back then it was just real estate. And then there was like, what do you have? Home Depot and the suppliers. But now the innovation and the problems that people are solving, like Trevor, if I'm a regional manager and the product that he has, right, I want to know all about that. Like it's a different conversation when you're helping somebody and you're invested in knowing like nothing's ever done. And so his team's out there curating their own event, their own conversations, and probably making it fun and interesting. I mean, that that's that's cool too, right? Like people love to align on shared interest and you know, bringing in a, a speaker and that kind of stuff. That's I love that. I would love to help people promote stuff like that. And I make events. Well I think it's just interesting. Like if you if you think about what's valuable for 
your customer and figure out a way that you can deliver it to them in the easiest way to eat the elephant, I think that's where it's, it's going to have the most impact. Cause like, I like, what was, the, there was somebody that was saying about like humans, humans sell to humans. And it's, it's something that like, we don't want these transactional relationships anymore. We want relationships that we can actually see value in versus the, what can I get from this person? Or uh, Trevor's calling me right now. He's probably wanting to sell me a couple bots. Like that, that's not what I want people to see when they see my name come up on the screen. It's more so like, Oh, I want to talk to Trevor because he has cool ideas or he has something fun coming up that I want to be part of and like th driving those, those dialogues more so than the, what is this person wanting from me dialogue? True, true story. I love it. I love it. And um, Jim, I know we've got some comments here from Sydney. Are there any, anything else? We want? J Dave, look, yes. I got, I want you guys to really feel like you're getting value. Um, and if I'm, if you're not, please let me know, like, what are the things you need to hear? And I don't have all the answers, right? I'm just trying to, um, so if you're not listening to Sydney's new podcast, you need to, it's, it's, it's really good. It's awesome. Like seriously, some of the coolest stuff out there right now is, is what she's doing. So Very cool. make, sure, make yeah. sure to follow her on LinkedIn. Awesome. Right. I'm having a party. It's no big deal. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I wanted to, I know you kind of like moved on from the subject a little bit, but you guys were talking about like the value of live events, like, you know, the big ones like NAA and AIM and, um, Obviously, like people are super busy there. It's a hard place to go and expect lead gen or s sign contracts or demos. But I really looked at those conferences as just an opportunity to have to form peer to peer relationships with my ideal customer profile. And so meeting them, having fun with them, adding them on LinkedIn, then creating content on LinkedIn that is interesting to me because I'm their peer. Um, that they're interested in as well, comment, finding out who they follow on LinkedIn, commenting my own hot takes on their posts, and then building that relation, like that social media relationship. It just takes, it takes that relationship that you form that you can only see them maybe once or twice a year. And it makes it so ongoing. So they kind of feel like you're in their inner circle of friends or, you know, industry network. And what, what I did from there was like Trevor said, uh, I didn't just start a podcast. It's very much similar to this format. It's, you know, the Chris Walker method from demand gen, just like how we all ripped him off. Um, you know, you get together, you talk about something that's important to everyone and then you leave it open and you hear really interesting things, rip the audio, put it on a podcast. But what we also did was we created a Slack community. So I have like, you know, a couple dozen of our ideal customer profile, like target for me as marketing directors, they're in our Slack community. They come to renter obsessed we talk, we go to each other when we need things and they even connect with each other. So I have prospects talking to customers um, organically about things they're really interested in. It just, it feels like more so giving than selling. Yeah, no, I love that. And you know what I really like about your comments is number one, people are still going to do things, right? And when they do them, they're, they, they have their own reasons, right? They're, they're, they're successful. They, they're, it's working for them. I'm just showing people an opportunity to when they do the math they might say well is it worth it for that much right and i love how you're taking that in person like the intent there is awesome I, not a lot of most people depend on the trade show whereas i love your strategy because you're not depending on the trade show for the lead you're there showing up and building the deeper relationship and you know connecting and all that stuff and have a great sort of post-event strategy to, you know, um, have more touch points and, and transfer the knowledge or the information that maybe somebody ought to know. Yeah, and, uh, it's like what you said, you, you own, you're winning when you start to own your community. First, yeah. you have to create the map of influence to figure, figure out what communities they're in so you can be there frequently saying interesting things. But then eventually the goal, right? Like what you're doing now is to own the community, to facilitate the conversation. True, true. And and a lot of people based on their DNA may just, what I, what I do differently than most is everything that I'm doing is I don't talk about sales or like um, how to track the sales or the conversions. Like 
those types of things. What we're talking to do is everything that we're doing here is designed to build your brand as more trusted and that you're the expert, trusted advisor in the thing that you do. And then by the time you show up at the trade show, if you choose to go, that they've already consumed like what you're doing. Maybe they understand more about what you're doing because they've heard a podcast or they've spoken at an event or these they've read an article. And so that relationship is accelerated and you get to spend time on the more valuable things that actually matter. Uh, so excited that, uh, appreciate your question That's, or not yeah, question, right. but and your remarks. Because like only 3% of people are like at an active buying mode right now. So as marketers, our job for the other 97% is to create that demand and educate them wholly on our product so that when they finally hit sales, it's all it is, is a contract signing, right? They don't right. need to be taught what you do anymore at that point. Right. True story. Awesome. Appreciate you sharing. Thanks for having me. I'll have to follow the podcast. What's the name of the podcast? Let's give a shout out. It's called Render Obsessed. All right. Great. We'll put that in the show notes. How about that? <laughs> That's really sweet. Thank you. Awesome. All right. What else have we got? Anything else, Jim? Uh, yeah, Patrick, there's um, a question about um, using these strategies to maybe reach out to a specific decision maker within a company. What are some ways to consider that? Is that or is that even possible? Yeah, I think what what we're talking about is that when you do that sort of ask that there was all these other things that have gone before that make the probability of that yes being accepted, right? So what I see is a lot of people rush the process. So they go for the sale, they go for the meeting, they go for the demo. And what they haven't done is they haven't established these other things that allow them to, you know, to, um, to be more aligned. So, you know, and it's tough. I mean, it's not easy. It's, that's more of probably a, a sales call or conversation. And actually, Jim, you're probably best at answering that one. Um, how you were, so Jim was able to get Apple computer as, um, a client, right? So, that seems like a pretty big reach out scenario. Tell me in, in, in short, I guess, how, how did you create a competitive advantage with them? Well, that, it's, a, it's a long story. The, the initial reach out um, was to create awareness and that's, that's a whole story in and of itself. But, um, and this was a long time ago um, before, really before the internet was a thing. Um, cell phones were a big, chunk of hardware that you put in your car and you couldn't really carry it around in your briefcase. So this is a long time ago, but so I was doing a lot of old school stuff. A lot of it still applies today. You still got to talk to people. You've got to get through the door. So I put um, what I call fish hooks out into the marketplace. Um, I went and developed relationships with vendors that um, Apple, I knew Apple would be engaged in for the processes that I was selling into, which was vibration and shock control engineering sale. So um, I'd go make friends with drop test houses and I'd go make friends with people at, in associations for hard drives. And I'd go make friends with um, executives that would be in um, engineering associations and do speeches and talks, the same kind of stuff, but it was all, uh, you know, more analog and very much one at a time. There was no leverage going on really. Um, so reaching out to a specific decision maker, I had to actually go to a meeting after hours um, out, you know, when I was traveling, usually it was up in San Jose, I lived down in Southern California. I was up away from my family doing all that stuff, um, you know, while I was out and about and going to a dinner meeting and introducing myself at the dinner table to an executive. That's how I did it. Today, it's so much different. You've got to, basically the same strategies, but you've got to approach it in a different way. And today they've got, they're bombarded with hundreds of inputs from all over the place. So you've got to be different and you really need to be focused on what their needs are and helping them to get their attention. So um, that's, yeah, you know, yeah. this, these strategies work really well to do that. I, I'll give you a little thing you can do some research on that I've studied too. It's um, called the nine word email. <clears throat> 
and it works magic. And, you know, a lot of times in that cold outreach, it's you're trying to get everything transferred in that one thing, but maybe it's just a response that you need. In, in ours, when we were launching our events way back in 2014, it would just be, we, we could give them all the information. Here's this event. Here's when it's happening. Here's what you're going to learn. Here are the speakers. It's like information, information, information. We sent an email out and said, hey, are you going to be attending the Multifamily Innovation Summit? Question mark. That was, that was it. And all of a sudden, <laughs> it was like, wait, this email's for me, you know? And, and uh, we got response. And then, you know, we kind of handpicked our, our community. So if you can think about how do you s send a nine-word email, like, for example, let's just take all your trade show leads. We talked trade shows today. So if you guys want to have like a homework assignment, take all your trade show leads. And um, let's say you sell leasing, uh, self-guided tours, whatever. And take those leads and just send them a nine-word email. And it's like, hey, you stopped by our booth. Did you ever roll out self-guided tours? Question mark. That's it. See what happens. And you'll see what happens. It just, you're asking for something different than a meeting and all that kind of stuff. It's just like, no, we never, ah, oh, I ran out of time. Or, oh, yeah, can we jump on a call? Nine words, question mark. And uh, no, like, can I get a demo or anything like that? Just literally about your product or, um, or about the thing that they were trying to do, you know. Um, yeah, less is more. And and maybe maybe some of these people, if they're speaking at other things out there, and they're you see that they're they spoke at this event or that event, it's like you could just send them a, like that nine word email. It's like, hey, what was it like speaking at this event? Question mark. Like just be human. If if you're really getting the rifle out, I guess for those things. If you're running into those hurdles, it's like that's gonna stand out from every other approach um, so it looks like we're coming up on the end of our time I want to make sure uh, we if I'm, I'm happy to stick around I don't want to keep you past uh, the time we spent together but if you have any other questions I'm happy to uh, share the time on those I don't have any more in the chat nothing more in the chat Awesome. Well, guys, uh, this is something we do every week, and we publish this on the podcast, too. So you can go to mclients.com, just click on, you know, uh, podcast, and you can see last week's episode. This one's happening now. And then, um, you know, follow us on social, all the places that you want to um, spend your time. LinkedIn is obviously a big, big community for the multifamily group. And uh, if there's anything that you guys need in the meantime, just send me a text. Uh, my number is 480-780-2611, or you can email me at patrick at mclients.com. But uh, with that, I guess I'll just wrap up and uh, invite you back for the next week. Each week, we'll send out an email with the agenda. And if that sounds interesting, pop on here. You know, this isn't demand to be, this isn't homework assignments, right? <laughs> this is designed to be helpful. And if you've got ideas, about what would be helpful, send them to me too, because sometimes what we get is we get a lot of emails and questions that uh, sometimes people just don't want to be public speakers and ask. And if that's you, just you can send an email to questions. Or is it question? I think it's question. Do you know what it is, uh, Brianna? I think it's question. Jim, I think you know what it is. It's in your email that I sent you today, but it's yeah, quest question. Question. question at mclients.com just we'll keep it confidential we can ask it here we don't have to say who asked it or anything like that but uh would love to rally from our community um some answers for you 